this is, in fact, my first public lecture ever in Canada, and uh, it's an honor. It's an honor to deliver it here, and I'm, I, I'm continually impressed by the energy for space that I see in Canada, even in the United States, when the people wane in this regard. I look to Canada and say, we need some more of that. So uh, this talk is going to be a celebration of space, but I think more important, it's also a warning sign for how occasionally people don't think about it the right way. And it's, it's a call to action, but it's a call to look at the dangers of inaction. Right? So, what I, so I call this sort of, uh, I don't know if you can see this slide, like people like way in the edge probably can't, so I'll just be totally talking about, I'll be on it for you, okay, for the people right on the edge. Sky's not the limit, you know what the limit is, like we are the limit, okay, so it's a sort of a warning sign that I'll be sharing with you for this talk. And you know what's often true with talks like this? They're like loosely veiled commercials that your speaker has to sell you a book or something like that. It's often what happens. And this, this is no exception, I just want to say. <laughs> no, actually, no. Uh, some of this is in a book, but I don't like giving book talks. That's why I write books, so I don't have to keep talking about it. That's why I write books. So this is an amalgam of many different aspects of things I've been thinking about, things that in my judgment are relevant to this audience. And so, oh, by the way, uh, let me just skip that here. Where they come? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I just want to just remind you where we are. You can't beat that. I'm going to say at this minute, right now, we've got an SUV-sized rover on Mars, and it runs on solar power and a little bit of other power. But basically, we've got a probe on route to Pluto. You can't beat that. I'm going to read it to you. Probe on route to Pluto. We've got a probe orbiting Saturn. The one on route to Pluto was called the New Horizons mission. Uh, Pluto is finally getting some attention that it had long never deserved. And, uh, <laughs> no, we all love Pluto. Uh, we, we're in orbit around Saturn with a Cassini uh, spacecraft. We are uh, we've got an orbit around Mercury. What else? We, we, we we're finding Goldilocks exoplanets. These are planets orbiting other stars at the right distance from their host star so that it could sustain liquid water. And every place on Earth we find liquid water, we find life. So if you're going to look for life in the universe, the Goldilocks planet is a good place to start. We're cataloging them. Uh, we discovered Higgs boson, the God particle. All right? If you were going to be a particle, that's the one you probably want to be, right? Because your field grants mass to other particles that go by. That's just, you know, you sit and just sit in the wrong chair. Yep, you got a proton, I gave you that. No, no mass for you today. But just imagine if you abuse that power, that would be interesting. Uh, uh, looking for dark matter particles. But so it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time. And much of these discoveries are derived, of course, from space-borne experiments. But uh, some of you may know that I, I have a checkered relationship with Pluto. <laughs> and I just thought I just wanted to put some of that to rest before we actually get to the meat of the talk. So I just want to say, uh, Pluto, uh, it's, it's, it's still not a planet, right? <laughs> No. 
No, I have more convincing argument for you than that. Uh, by the way, Pluto is the only planet discovered by an American. And so I think the resistance to Pluto's emotion was greatest in America. But an American could have never named it Pluto, interestingly. It was named by a, a girl in England who was very well connected, apparently. Uh, she had just learned her Roman gods. Her father was head of the Cambridge Library, who was friends with the astronomer Royale, who knew the Lowell Observatory in Arizona. And so this all got connected. And he asked her, what would she call it? She said Pluto, and it stuck. Uh, the reason why an American could have never called it Pluto is because at the time, in the 1920s, there was a widely advertised mineral laxative called Pluto water. <laughs> Recommended by doctors everywhere for relief of constipation. When nature won't, Pluto will. You see? There you go. So no one and no one, nobody in, in view of these ads was thinking cosmic object <laughs> or Pluto. But uh, I'm associated with the, the motion of Pluto, not because I had anything to do with it, although I, 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 maybe I'm an accessory. I drove the getaway car, all right? In New York, we opened a new facility in the year 2000, and we sort of read where things were headed. Pluto was, we did something different with Pluto, and organized it, placed it with the other icy bodies in the outer solar system, the Kuiper belt of comets. That's all we did. That's what we did. Well, that at page one of the New York Times, Pluto not a planet. Only in New York. This and and and, and I for the six years I got hate mail from elementary school children. Right? <laughs> Here's one of the letters, I'll have to read it to you. Okay? <laughs> Dear scientist, what do you call Pluto if it's not a planet anymore? If you make it a planet again, all the science books will be right. See, so here's a child worried about the science books, not wanting them to be wrong. So that's, uh, that's, you want to be the opposite of that, all right? You want them to be sort of keep moving with what's up today. If there are people who live there, they won't exist. Why can't Pluto be a planet? If it's small, that doesn't mean it doesn't have to be a planet anymore. Some people like Pluto. If it doesn't exist, then they don't have a favorite planet. Please write back, but not in cursive, because I can't read in cursive. <laughs> but my favorite letter from Pluto I got just like a year ago. It was a 22-year-old student. And he said, Dear Dr. Tyson, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 12 years ago, I wrote you a letter complaining that you demoted Pluto. Well, I've since studied the problem, and now I agree with you entirely. And I'm sorry that in my original letter, I called you a poo poo head. <laughs> Signed, it was like a straight letter. One of my favorite Pluto cartoons is this one, a victim of downsizing for Pluto. Pluto is just shown as a beggar on the street corner. He's got shoes on and a little cup with pencils in it. Or Pluto. Uh, so, I just want to just, Pluto, there's six moons in the solar system bigger than Pluto. Did the guy who like spoke up loudly a few slides ago, uh, are you still there, where are you? Was it you or you weren't there? Someone else, I heard the sound back then. Oh, but at one point, I, I can triangulate. Let's triangulate on the, on the hands. A, there are six moons in the solar system bigger than Pluto. B, our moon is bigger than Pluto. C, our moon has five times the mass of Pluto. D, D. Pluto is more than half made of ice. 
If you were Pluto to where Earth is right now, heat from the sun would evaporate the ice and it would grow a tail. And that is no kind of behavior for a planet. You can't have a planet with tails. I'm sorry. Pluto's orbit crosses the orbit of another planet. How misbehaved can you get? Comets cross the orbits of other planets. So we just reassign Pluto to join other icy brethren in the outer solar system that were freshly discovered in the late, in the middle of the late 1990s. Now there are thousands of these frozen bodies in the outer solar system. So I think Pluto's happier there. It's with friends. <laughs> and it's one of the biggest of its kind out there, rather than being the puniest planet. So, get over it. Okay, so now, <laughs> I want to just intro space in a rather morbid way. Uh, there are a lot of people who say, Earth, oh, Earth is a haven for life. Oh, Earth is, Earth is beautiful. <laughs> uh, okay, let me just sort of tell you something here, that Earth actually is trying its hardest to kill you. If you don't realize this, I'm going to tell you. For example, 97% of all species that ever lived on this Earth are now extinct. There's Mother Earth for you. We have an earthquake. I got the list. What's my list? Yeah, so earthquakes and you know volcanoes and tsunamis and hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, droughts, floods, disease, plagues, heat waves. If you tally the death toll. Of all blizzards, sure. <laughs> Tally the death toll. It is staggering, especially when you consider the hurricanes and the earthquakes. And drought. Earth is really just trying to kill us all. And it's not only Earth, the universe wants to kill you as well, right? And the universe is awesome at it. So there's, there's a list, you know, so the gamma, uh, what do I have here, gamma ray bursts. These are the largest explosions in the universe since the Big Bang, all right? And these things beam serious energy out into the universe. If one of these bursts happened in our galaxy, aimed towards Earth, it would overrun the ozone layer, the high energy radiation from it. That's the first wave. The second wave, once the ozone layer is overrun, the rest of the radiation comes all the way down to the surface and it will completely mess with your DNA. Gamma rays are what made the Hulk big, green, and ugly. Okay? Just an FYI on exposure to gamma rays. A lesser thing, but more common, supernova explosions. Uh, these, there's some extinction episodes in the fossil record where people are investigating whether there was a nearby supernova whose energy overrode the biosphere at the time. Black holes, you want to avoid these at all costs. <laughs> Just saying, there. We have solar storms. These things send high energy particles to Earth. We're protected from most of them with our magnetic field. The particles see our magnetic field and split positive and negative, and they spiral down towards the poles, that's fine. And it renders the atmosphere aglow. And we call that aurora in the north aurora borealis, in the south aurora australis. And we look at them and see how pretty it is, not really thinking how deadly they are. Uh, they're comet impacts, asteroid impacts. These are bad things. The dinosaurs, our favorite extinct uh, animals went extinct 65 million years ago from an asteroid impact. And you think of the dinosaurs as being, no, 70% of the life forms on Earth went extinct in that episode. This is the universe just messing with us, all right? And that asteroid, we know where it hit. The tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. We found the crater. Actually, oil drillers found the crater. They have something called a gravitometer, and it shows where their 
mass anomalies in the ground, so you can find out whether there's bedrock or oil, they have different mass signatures on the global gravity, and they found this, this pattern that formed a circle in, in the compressed rock that formed a circle. And this circle is like hundreds of miles in circumference. And so they dug it up, dated the, the, the rim 65 million years ago. There it is, the smoke and the gun. Kill our asteroids. Yeah. We got it. Uh, this would have been a, a bad day on Earth. You didn't want to be around for that one. Artist gloves showing death and destruction on Earth. Again, for like the eight people who don't have the right angle to see this. This is an artist rendering of a bad day on Earth. Right? It, maybe you can see this screen. Can you guys see this screen? Yeah, that's this screen up here. Yeah, so you guys here, just check this out. You got that? Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. You got that? Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, 65, the one that took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago was about the size of Mount Everest. A little larger. And again, these are artists attempting to draw what this would look like. This is probably comes closest to what happened. So, and we have some pterodactyls checking out what the situation. You know, I, I would show this image to a high school class. And, and in high school, who sits in the front row? The nerds, of course. And, and, the, and the cool people sit in the back row. So the, a question came from the front row. And I'm saying, this will be an enlightened question, because these are the best students here in the front row. So that would tell you is that an actual photograph? <laughs> how, how do you, as an educator, what do you do in that situation? <laughs> so I thought to myself, all right, suppose I said yes. And then how? Oh, I said, well, yes, okay, the pterodactyl had a digital camera, and from the fossil, we recovered the SD chip, put it in, got the photos. <laughs> there comes a time when educators really just want to give up. <laughs> uh, we just passed the one year anniversary. We're like one year, one month anniversary of the asteroid that exploded over Chelyabinsk, Russia, in the Ural Mountains. How, were you around thinking about it? you connected to the news a year ago when this happened? Okay, I was, all right, because I'm asleep. And 4.30 in the morning, my phone rings. Usually just somebody dies when that happens, right? So if I answer it, uh, Dr. Tyson, this is uh, NBC's The Today Show. Uh, we'd like you to comment on an asteroid that just exploded over Russia. I said, what? No, that's not scheduled yet for let me uh, we have a video, a thousand people were, at the time they said, struck by the asteroid. I said, okay, show me the video. And I'm like the 12th person to view this video. And there it is, because in Russia and in many parts of Europe, there are front-facing cameras on your vehicles. So anybody who is driving, you see everything out the front window. So the people just driving along, it's very early in the morning for them, and the, and, and there it was. Was it the morning or evening? But anyhow, the sun isn't fully up yet. And you see the streak in the sky. And then it explodes. And it's like brighter within the sun. And so people wonder, what is, well, we know it's his national. Not big enough to have caught very early. All right? Because if it's really big, we know it's coming. Small enough to sort of get in basically under our radar. And you only notice it when it's too late. Well, I have that original video. It's right here. And let's see if I can, it works. Let's see if I can play this. Oh, this, this slide I first showed eight weeks after it happened. And so, I don't know if, I, if, I, if the video works. Yeah, I don't know if I can do it. You know, I didn't, okay, I, you know what I didn't do? I didn't fully make the connection to it. But anyhow, in the sky, the, 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 the asteroid comes and it's brighter than the sun. It, it wipes, it, it, it washes out the entire view. Now here's what happened. 
People who didn't remember Physics 101, this is what they did. They're in there eating breakfast, and this Steven Spielberg E.T. brightness light comes in their window, okay? Out of nowhere. So what do they do? They said, oh, I wonder what that light is. They get up from the chair, go to the window, look out the window. Light travels faster than sound. Right when everybody's looking out the window, bam! The shockwave hits. A thousand people were injured. Fifteen hundred people were injured because of flying glass. The shockwave from this asteroid blasted thousands of windows in the city, knocked down walls, broke ceilings. And so this was the greatest disaster you could have without anybody dying. Nobody done it, but it's a shot across our back. The universe wants to kill us, and we have a space program to do something about it. I tweeted jokingly, but saddeningly, I don't want to be the laughing stock of aliens in the Milky Way galaxy if they ended up learning that we went extinct from an asteroid, even though we had a space program that could have done something. That'd just be embarrassing. I don't want to be that. We go extinct, and then the roaches and rats rise up in our place. Let's visit their museums in a thousand years. There'll be bones of humans on display in their natural history museums. Species that would formerly rule the Earth. They were too stupid to fund their space program and went extinct from an asteroid. Right? The rats will be saying, hmm. They probably wouldn't say too stupid. They'd say, didn't have the foresight. Didn't have the foresight. You know the main thing that's holding back the size of rats? Is that they want to hide from us. And so they have to fit inside of pipes and nooks and crannies. If we were not here to exterminate the rats that couldn't fit into the pipes, the bigger ones would just get bigger. So there's actually a book called, I forgot the exact title, After Humans or something like that. And it shows all the animals that sort of rise up and fill up our niche. That's what we did. He took out the dinosaurs, our mammal ancestors, in every place but Kentucky. Our animal, mammal ancestors, Russian meteor, what do we have here? 17 meters across, about the size of this stage area. All right, how fast was it going? It weighed about, what do we have here? Yeah, so 17 meters across, it weighed 10,000 tons. It's going 40,000, I'm sorry, I'm using miles here, miles per hour. You guys have heard of miles, right? <laughs> Quick conversion there, what do we get? We get sort of 60,000 kilometers an hour. That's fast. That's this sucker is moving. And if you're going that fast and you're made of stone, the atmosphere is a brick wall to you. And you basically explode in the atmosphere. And that's what this did. It exploded 20 miles up with an energy of 500 kilotons of TNT, which is how we measure the energy of explosions. That is 25 times the energy of the atom bomb that exploded over Hiroshima. The atom bomb that exploded over Hiroshima exploded half a mile up. By count, it was a calculated height. If you have it explode on impact, half the energy goes into making a crater, rather than killing people. This was wartime, so they actually calculate this. Well, had that asteroid exploded half a mile up, no one who witnessed it would be alive to talk about it. No buildings would have been left standing. We would come upon the region later and wonder what happened. So, 
And then this is a little one. That's the size of this stage. You start getting mountain-sized asteroids coming in and you don't know about it. That's the universe trying to kill you. And so it, it shattered without, it's, that number went up since I made this slide. It's 1,500 people. By the way, there's an asteroid the size of your stadium out there named Apophis. Apophis, the Egyptian god of darkness and evil, yeah. <laughs> Why is Apophis named that? Well, we discovered Apophis, we, I mean, I got, I got people who do this. I didn't discover it. We have asteroid hunters who discovered Apophis. In, 20, in 2004, in December, Apophis was discovered. You do a quick cal orbit calculation, you find out it's intersecting the orbit of the Earth. So we have a whole satchel of names of evil gods after whom we name these asteroids. <laughs> Had it not been across Earth's orbit, we'd, we'd call it Tiffany or something. <laughs> Something non-threatening, right? This sucker is called Apophis. It's the size of a stadium. There's some ideas on how to deflect it. It's going to have a close approach in April, in the year 2029. And uh, April 13th, actually, which is a Friday. <laughs> Just a disclosure here. Just so you know. Just, uh, come back to me when you find out about that. It's Friday the 13th, April 2029. Apophis, something the size of your stadium, will come close enough to Earth to dip below our orbiting satellites. It'll be the biggest, closest thing we have ever measured to come by Earth. This is basically a buzz cut. We will learn on that pass whether the asteroid will hit us seven years later. Seven years later. Seven years later, if it hits us, it will hit the west coast of the United States in the ocean, 500 kilometers west of Santa Monica. It will create a tsunami five stories tall. Five stories tall. It'll basically wipe clean the entire west coast of the United States and North America. So, some, so up in Canada, you feel some of this, but the the and the Aleutian Islands. But nobody gets to die. All you have to do is evacuate the entire west coast of North America <laughs> at the right time, right? But you know, there's going to be two people who will die. You know who they are. Remember, it's, it's coming closer to California here, so there'll be the stupid surfer who wants to surf the tsunami. You know? I don't know if you have them in Canada, but we got them in America. Right? Uh, and then there's, you ever see the weather, the weather man is always trying to get the camera guy closer to, to the surf? You ever see If you look over here, where the light the cameraman escapes, you know, can I get the camera man to <laughs> A dead surfer and a dead weatherman, I think we can agree to. Uh, people react interestingly if they know they're going to die the next day. Uh, the New York Post polled some people and asked them, uh, if, if you knew the asteroid was going to come tomorrow, uh, what would you do today? So I'm going to read these to you. These are, these are kind of fun. Church and alcohol in the final days. I'd spend all the money I have on women and alcohol. I'd fly to the Bahamas, sit on a beach with a tequila until the asteroid hit. Elizabeth Payne, research assistant. I get married immediately since I'm going to later this year anyway. We forget about the honeymoon. We just start getting loaded right after the wedding, okay? <laughs> Pete Calabisca, 19 college student. I'd get together with all my friends and my family, have a big farewell party where we'd all get drunk. <laughs> and I'd go on a date with Cindy Crawford. <laughs> I, I, I think that last one is not, not going to happen, right? <laughs> so what, what disturbs me a little, I don't want to say disturb, what concerns me is no one here is saying, I try to find a way to deflect it. 
I try to find a way to save Earth. The people who think that way are people trained at solving problems we've never seen before. These are engineers, scientists, STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and math. You want those people around you. Because when disaster strikes, most people that I've seen say, they say, buy toilet paper, or whatever people, whatever, whatever, whatever you're carrying with you as you escape the scene of the disaster, water, whatever. I love the people say, how can I stop that? Everybody doesn't have to think that way, but you just need enough so that we can all gather around and understand what that support would be. You know, you don't want this situation. These are two dinosaurs. One is saying to the other, all I'm saying is, now is the time to develop the technology to deflect an asteroid. <laughs> My favorite poster of all, wait for this. My favorite. Asteroids are nature's way of asking, how's that space program coming along? <laughs> Let, let, me, let, me, let me just tell you this. Often when we look back through time and we find visionaries and we quote them and say, oh, look how much they knew. Look at what insight they brought to our future. Well, if you look hard enough, you can find some really embarrassing, bone-headed quotes. And I just want to look at a little bit of the history of space exploration to see what we were up against as a culture and as a society. So I'll read this to you. This is a from an editorial in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle on the eve of the 20th century. They said, by the way, in the year 1900, we were riding high. We had airships, dirigibles, the railroads across the country, the, the, the internal combustion engine automobile was developed by uh, Carl Benz, and roads were all over, and so, pe and so people were riding high. It is scarcely possible that the 20th century will witness improvements in transportation that will be as great as were those in the 19th century. Three years later, we have the airplane. <laughs> so this is a completely bone-headed statement. It is someone who thinks that what's around them is somehow the pinnacle of what can be achieved. So it's people like this who you don't want in charge of anything. Right? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> now, these again, these are people who should know better. Man will not fly for 50 years. Wilbur Wright to his brother Orville in 1901. You think they would know that? All right, so now you get the airplane invented. So now look what people say. No flying machine will ever fly from New York to Paris. Orville Wright, 1908. We forget these quotes. These are out there. We, so, we've sifted through the countless stuff people talk about, pick the one that happened to be right and say, oh, he's a visionary. Let's move forward 40 years. Landing and moving around on the moon offers so many serious problems for human beings that it may take science another 200 years to lick them. Science Digest, August 1948. 200 years? How many more years did it take to lick them? 20 years. 20. Okay, so here's what happened. All th these decades, no one had any understanding of the importance of technology, or how creative we are as a species, or how, how, or how resources, when properly allocated in a nation, can actually bring a pace of discovery far beyond what you might have imagined. So the last possible statement that could be made in that vein, 
was in February 1957. Here we go. Man will never reach the moon regardless of all future scientific advances. Lead the forest, radio pioneer. All right, so watch what happens. At the end of 1957, Sputnik gets launched by the Soviet Union. And all of a sudden, space is pierced. It is, you can reach it because we have hardware in orbit around the Earth. And all of a sudden, what went from pessimistic outlooks of our future in space became over-optimistic outlooks for our future in space. People said, we go into space, we can do anything at all, and it'll just happen. So, Russia goes into space, we found NASA in 1958. 1962, I just learned, Canada launched its first, its first satellite, Canada's in there with, with us, and so here's the Wall Street Journal. 1966. The Apollo program is well underway. Funding is flowing. Here we go. The most ambitious United States space endeavor in the years ahead will be the campaign to land men on Mars. Most test experts estimate that can be accomplished by 1985. 1985. That's like 30 years ago. They're speaking 20 years into the future, about a time 30 years ago to us, about an accomplishment that we are nowhere near reaching. Wall Street Journal. A manned lunar base will be in existence by 1986. The Futurist, spoken in 1967. Here's my favorite one. By the year 2000, 50,000 people will be living and working in space. How many people were living and working in space in the year 2000? Three. <laughs> the three astronauts on the space station. There's also this tendency to oversell achievements. And it's mixed that with a faulty memory, and we don't even understand what's driving things. So let's go back to Yuri Gagarin, launched into orbit by the Soviet Union. He's the fourth mammal, fourth mammal species to achieve this feat. So here's what happened. So we came to the 50th anniversary of this, and, um, and everyone was waiting for me to tweet something on it. I don't tweet unless there's something I can say. I'm like, oh, congratulations, 50th anniversary. I don't want, I don't want this decade to be the decade of the 50th anniversaries of things that happened in the 1960s. That means you're not actually doing anything. You're just looking back and saying, hey, that was cool, let's just commemorate that. Do you think in the 1960s they were commemorating anything that happened in the 19-teens? Did you, anybody old enough, do you remember? Were we talking about stuff that happened in the 19-teens? Look what they did in 1916. Look what they did in 1912. No. We were thinking about the future. When you think about the future, the past received fast. So, there I'm tweeting, I said, I gotta say something different. So I said, he's the fourth mammal species to achieve this feat. So we're all celebrating a man going into space, but he was preceded, preceded by, what's my list? Okay, a dogs. Guinea pigs, mice, then you had Yuri Gagarin, then you had a chimpanzee, then you had an American human. So in the United States, there's John Glenn, he's the hero and everything, but it's like, what does it mean? Yeah, we can put heroes up, but be honest about what's going on. Otherwise, it comes back at you. It comes back to bite you, because you're building a false. And false, and if this goes on, check this out. So, in, in the United States, we think of ourselves as pioneers in space because we landed on the moon, walked on the moon, cool, I got that. But pioneer means you did stuff first. If you tally who did stuff first in space, the United States loses that contest, all right? Here's the Soviet Union and stuff they 
landed it first in space. They invented the rocket formula, which is why the, the ships have to be so large. They need fuel to put fuel into orbit to burn that fuel later, right? This is the problem with rockets. That's why the Saturn Cloud rocket, the astronauts are the up and down bitty part, they all the rest is a rocket bomb. All of it is fuel. All the rest. So, rocket form, first satellite in orbit, first animal in space, first human in space, first woman in space, first black person in space. That was someone from Cuba. The first to, they were the first to land on the moon with the spacecraft. The first lunar rover, first to photograph the far side. Earth rockets, first to land on Venus, Mars, first spacewalk. First ship-to-ship -ship transmission, first space station. Longest time logged in space, and then the safest manned vehicle there ever was in the Soyuz capsule. So, no, this, I mean, this is part of So, America, we did a few things, okay? We had the first space docking, first humans to leave orbit, First to land humans on the moon, we were the first to cross the asteroid belt, the first to achieve hyperbolic velocity, the speed necessary to escape the solar system entirely and never come back. This is good. I'm not, I don't want to belittle this, but we have to be honest about what your achievements are. And part of that goes to what I call Apollo worship. People say, yeah, that's our golden age. But it's, you know what it is? It's, it's necrophilia, is what it is. It's the. You know, never it's, if you haven't done anything great lately, you just bring up older stuff and talk about it. And say, look at how great we were, so think of us as great now. No, it doesn't work that way. No, I don't think so. In fact, there is no technology of anything where you look back at the first of its kind and say, boy, look at how they did it back then. Isn't that great? You walk by the Saturn V rocket today, it's like the, the apes in the monolith in 2001. It's like, how did they do this? <sighs> this thing went to the moon because we can't do it today. There is no ship in the world capable of taking a human out of low Earth orbit. Stuff we were doing routinely in the 1960s, nobody can do today. What the? This feels a little bit like Europeans during the Dark Ages looking at the architecture of the Romans, left over from the Roman Empire, wondering how to build an arch, wondering how to build a dome. All that knowledge got lost. I'll just show you an example of how this works. So this is an image of very early skates. We don't look at that and say, gee, I wish I, I had a pair of those. You look at these and say, I wish I had a pair of those, okay? Skating technology has moved forward, and we do not worship the first of its kind. How about the first cell phone? Yeah, oh my goodness. I want one of those. Yeah, back then, you, you got a date at the bar if you pulled out one of these shoulder-launched cell phones, okay? <laughs> But we don't revere that. You know, we, re we revere other things. And that's, that's the, I think that's the iPhone 3, even. The very first automobile, it looked great at a museum. That's actually Carl Benz, the first internal combustion engine. They had cars that were, ran on steam, but that's just like a, a locomotive on the road. Uh, this, this was the true, real, true first invention. But they've come a long way. This is the modern uh, Mercedes-Benz with knife opening. So cars have come a long way. Airplanes have come a long way. There's Wilbur and Marble Wright wondering if they'll ever fly from New York to Paris and in the first plane. But planes have come a long way. Now we've got, what, the Airbus 380? Look at this sucker. This thing it looks like a, an anaconda that just swallowed a pig, all right? <laughs> This thing, I've flown on this thing. It's like, you don't even know you're on an airplane. You don't even know you're taking off. That's how big it is. You just get on it, and then you get off, and you're in a whole other country, right? So planes have come a long way, although this is not the coolest of the planes. 
you know, there's a cool plane for you, the Concord. Why does the Concord look so awesome? You know why? Because there hasn't been a better plane since then. That is a faster plane, a cooler looking plane, a more modern plane. That's why this still looks awesome. Because we've not gone any place since then. That's the measure of whether you're actually in the business or not. The liquid fuel rocket, Robert Goddard. Now we've got rockets launching, you know, satellites, we're launching things all the time. The X-1, I think this was, the first uh, plane to break the sound barrier. Back then, this looked awesome. Look, this plane with a pointy nose. Wow, look at that, that's really fast. If you're around back then, that's what you're thinking. But we kept going forward. And probably the pinnacle of this design is the, the SR-71. The U.S. Air Force, SR-71. An unpublicized top speed. Uh, it's, it, can, it can pass Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, a little bit. Um, this is cool. We have one of these on the deck of the Intrepid aircraft carrier docked in Manhattan, in New York. And you just come up and say, wow, that's cool. But wait a minute. This was designed back in the 1970s. It's 40 years old. Why does it look cool? We don't have anything better than that. That's why this looks cool. Nothing has flown faster than this since. There's a stagnation there. You won't even know what this is. This is, a, this is like a really early, one of the first prototype televisions. Everyone under 25 in the audience said, wow, you guys really had it bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how bad this was compared to today. It's how good this was compared to anything that came before it. That's what you have to be thinking here. But of course, TV has moved on, and now we have, of course, big flat panel. It goes on and on and on. How about the first computer? Yeah. How's that for a four-function calculator right there? An entire room. An entire room. Then we had sort of the first desktop computer right there. That one. If you had one of those, you were you got dates if you had one of those too. <laughs> uh, the very first mouse. That's the actual very first mouse. And the mice have now come and now they're out. They don't, they don't use them anymore. The first, uh, the second desktop computer, the, now, this is the, the Macintosh, advertised during the Super Bowl in the year 1984. But we've moved on, you know, computers are thin and powerful. So I ask you, I show you the Saturn V rocket. The only spacecraft to ever leave Earth for another destination. It is a stunning achievement in engineering, in science, and in ambition, in funding, in vision statement. You kind of need all of that to keep that adventure going. Funding, ambition, vision statement. But I tell you now, not only do we not even have a Saturn V rocket, there is not another picture that I can show you of something that has come since then. We have several Saturn Vs on display. One of them is in captivity in Huntsville, Alabama. This one is in Houston. And just for context, the nozzle, oh, there's five nozzles in the bottom. The nozzle is large enough for you to have like a tea party for eight in each nozzle. And the entire length is fuel. So I don't know what the next one will be. But there is some, there's some energy in the air, internationally, and here in Canada. And so I like this fact. I just want to share some of this enthusiasm with you, some of this vision statement that you need. I have a collection of currency from around the world, a pre-Euro currency, where people put, countries put their own on their currency. Typically they're with presidents and kings and queens and things, but occasionally they'll put scientists. So you won't be able to see all the detail on this, but I have bills from different countries around the world. 
So the upper right is Tesla, a Yugoslavian note. Uh, we have Copernicus in the middle right. There's, there's Poland. We have Marconi from Italy in the bottom right, the pioneer radio wave communication. We have Alexandra Volka. What do we name after him? But the, the unit of electricity, uh, of electromotive force. We have Volta, we have Antoine saint exupéry in the middle left, not a scientist, but an aviator, wrote the book, The Little Prince. They put The Little Prince on the currency, the, the, the 50 francs. And there's a guy in the upper left, I keep forgetting his name, but he's Bulgarian, he's a scientist. Flip over the currency, and you get the iconography of their, of their trade. On the upper right, is, it's an uh, electrical discharge machine that Tesla developed. We have a pseudo-heliocentric illustration. The artist, I think, was given a little too much freedom there. Uh, we have the Volta's monument in the bottom left. And we see the biplane used by, by the Schubert. Let's keep going. We have money made of polymer in Romania. This is the front and back side in the upper left. Romania had a total solar eclipse go across their country. And that's the eclipse track shown on the, on the left. They were so enchanted by this that they put it on their currency. And so on one side you see the eclipse track. On the other side, again, the artist got a little too much freedom there, I think. I don't know what this is. There's like a pink blob coming in to attack the solar system. <laughs> The pink thingy, amoeba from space. Uh, in the bottom right, in England, had many great scientists, and they're on their currency. Uh, Charles Darwin was on the ten pound note. He's shown here, old and wise, he's bald with a big beard. But of course, he did his greatest work before he was twenty-six. So really, they should put him up here looking like a, a, a dashing young man at twenty-six. But I think it didn't carry the, the didn't have the gravitas. That would, if you show him nearly dead. Um, if you, so what was his favorite animal from the Galapagos that helped him come up with? The finches, of course. So on this note, we have a hummingbird, okay? So, they, they, I think the artist said, look, it's got a beak, all right? It's the beak that matters here, right? So the artist was not talking to the scientist in this. Uh, we go to the Middle East. So these are, these are countries celebrating their scientists. Like this, is, this is a wonderful thing. This is what tells me, because the United States is not really doing that, I think it's the rest of the world is going to rise up. And the United, we had our century, it was like the 20th century, and the rest of the world is going to rise up and it's going to watch. Okay? That's the trend line right now. Here's the Middle East uh, in Iraq. They had to go, they went a little far back for this, but this is Ibn Abdelhazen who figured out how sight works. This is a thousand years ago in Baghdad. A brilliant man who noticed what light did through the lens of your eye. Before him, people thought the way you see is a beam of light comes out of your eyes and you're illuminating what's in front of you. Okay, like, like Superman sending x-rays out. Right? But no, that's not how it works. He figured it out. He's on their currency. And we have a five, I don't know what the unit is in Israel, we have an Israeli currency with Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein is not Israeli, but he's really smart, so everybody wants to claim him. That's what happens <laughs> when you're really, really smart, everybody. But once again, these are great scientists. We'll keep going. Back to Europe, uh, Euler from uh, Switzerland. We have Euler, brilliant mathematician, Galileo. In Italy, Carl Friedrich Gauss in the middle right. We have Faraday from England who invented electricity as we know it today. He developed the, 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 the generator, how to turn sort of moving water and steam into electricity. We have uh, Louis Pasteur at the bottom left, my man Isaac Newton on the one down note. And then you look carefully. By the way, if you think in the world, what country sort of has the best marketing uh, for their engineers? Like when you think of engineering, what country do you think of? Germany, of course. German engineering. German, you hear that all the time. And it's, it's earned. And they have some good engineers over there. It's earned. They could be good engineers in Poland, 
but you just never hear any marketing saying, Polish engineering, right? You, you just don't hear that. Uh, you just, just, okay, German engineering. So then I looked at this 10, 10 Deutschmarks of Gauss, and I said, well, if I zoom in, what do I see? I say, whoa, 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 there's a mathematical distribution function all under the currency. <laughs> In America, we have museums with humans coexisting with dinosaurs. And in Germany, they have mathematical distribution functions they had before the euro came uh, on their currency. You don't have to know what this means, but you know it's important because it's on your currency. And you know it's associated with the great mind. This is the famous bell curve that Gauss developed, discovered, basically. And it's a distribution function, so it's not even a regular math equation. It's a function. And so, I wonder, if you're a kid growing up in Germany and you see this, you just, you just make you a little more comfortable with, with math. You don't have to be a mathematician, but you know it's there and you know it's important. And later on, you're not rejecting it, simply because you don't want to like it. I, I asked myself in America, do we have any scientists on our money? We actually have one as well. We got Ben. We got Ben Franklin on the hundred dollar note. So I said, good. He's a, he was a big experimenter in electricity. Then you go find the icons related to his experiments in electricity. Is there a lightning bolt? No. Is there a kite where he had hung the key? On? No. He invented a lightning rod. Let's go find that. No, he's not on our money because of the science, because he's a founding father. Do you know how important the lightning rod is? The lightning rod saves you two ways. It's a piece of metal at the top part of your building, and as, as you have a thunderstorm coming, as charges build up in the ground, they easily discharge into the air through this metal spike. Reducing the, the, the electrical difference between the cloud and the ground so that the lightning is no longer interested in striking you. And if it does strike you, it hits the lightning rod. This is cool. In his day, late 1700s, early 1800s, what are the tallest structures in any town? Churches. If you're lightning, what's the first thing you're going to hit? Churches. Back then, there was church-church warfare in the following way. A town's church would get hit by lightning, destroy the church. The other town would say, see, you're worshiping a false god over there. Come to our church. This went on all the time. Ben puts a lightning rod in each church. He's accused of heresy for thwarting the will of God. Then I thought, what? What God are you worshiping if this man, beer, wine drinking, womanizing man, thwarts the will of your God? What God is that? I don't know. And I got to hand it to you guys here. I got to hand it. I just was called to my attention two weeks ago. On your five dollar note, I flipped that sucker over, and there's your Canada. at the expense of some, a hockey stick or something <laughs> on this before. But I think hockey doesn't need to be on the currency to be popular. Right? You got that one already. Right? And I heard Manitoba just got a team back. Is that right? <laughs> yes. So, I don't know if you can see it from a distance, but we've got an astronaut, the Canada arm, responsible for putting everything together in space. That arm just goes out, turns, Grabs here, puts that, neck, snares the satellite. That is a busy arm and every time, no matter what angle it is, there's a maple leaf in full view, you know? 
And the funny thing, I don't know if you can see, but at the bottom one, there's, there's like maple leaf from space coming in. I don't know if you can see that. It looks actually a little bit, first time I've ever thought a maple leaf looked menacing, right? It's like, it's like quick, get out of <laughs> Imagine something in the movie Gravity, you know? The maple attack of the maple leaf from space. Uh, I worry that if you don't have these kinds of inspiring forces operating, that there can be a cost to society. There's a cost. So here's a, here's a headline I found back in, in the States. Ready? Lamenting the, the state of the school system. Half the schools in the district are below average. And I thought, study the locations of exit doors on takeoff. This was a study about eight years ago, which led to the change in the flight attendant rubric at the beginning. Now they include, take a look to where your nearest exit is, it could be behind you. We all hear, 10 years ago they never said that. It's because of this study. If you know where your exit doors are, 80% of the survivors knew where the exit doors were. There's a problem. Suppose, suppose 100% of the dead people studied the locations of the exit doors on takeoff. That would mean you're more likely to die if you look to where the exit doors were, but you'll never notice because they're dead. Okay? Dead people, you can't interview dead people. Okay? So this, is, this statistic is missing half of the data that should be there in order to make the proper judgment. So the education of the school system matters here for people to interpret information. You can't just say, let's go to space. You have to build that. You have to build that currency. You build the fluency, the mathematical fluency. You have to, you have to earn it in your educational system. One more here, I got you like this one? Okay. <laughs> Member of the US Congress. 360 degrees on that issue. But let me remind you what 360 degrees is. That's 360 degrees. You are still facing the same direction. And then I thought to myself, Ooh, maybe, he could have just been mathematically illiterate, but what could be worse is if he knew exactly what he was talking about, <laughs> but, but didn't want you to think that he didn't change his mind at all, and then used his knowledge of math for diabolical purposes. <laughs> so I don't know what's worse, actually. There's some folks in here old enough to remember what tomorrow looked like in the 1960s. This is not just the product of LSD <laughs> thinking, okay? People actually thought about tomorrow all the time. You didn't have to go more than a week without finding an article in the major newspapers or the magazines. The city of tomorrow, the home of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow, health of tomorrow. All the time these articles pick. Raise your hand if you remember what I'm talking about, the old time. Old, old Time's got the good seats down here, okay? How'd you guys get all the good seats? You got connections, that's what it is. Okay, uh, you remember these, and they all stopped. You know when they stopped? When we stopped going to the moon. Check it out. All those articles from the 1960s, early 70s. Late 70s came, that all stopped. 80s, all stopped. I claim that if we go back into space in a big way, be it international or even if it's just 
nation by nation, then the dream state goes to another place. The tomorrow is what technology and science can bring me. Not just what is my next act. We have huge problems facing our culture and our civilization, in energy, in health, in security. You can't just wish those solutions to come. And for me, the greatest force of nature operating on the ambitions of who's going to be a scientist and engineer are the forces of the universe, space. I want to end with a reflection on what Carl Sagan had called the pale blue dot. He took a picture of Voyager 1 of the spacecraft at a hyperbolic velocity past Neptune, and then by his command, with NASA's permission, the camera on Neptune faced backwards towards the center of the solar system, and we took a selfie from Earth. <laughs> And it came to be known as the Pale Blue Dot. Uh, this was reprised with the Cassini uh, spacecraft just a year ago. Cassini is around Saturn. So Cassini went to the back side of Saturn. This is, Saturn. this is an actual photograph of Saturn eclipsing the sun. So sunlight peeking through the outer gaseous layer, and that's why the, there's a ring around Saturn that's sunlight coming through the thinner parts of the atmosphere. The ring is illuminated from below. And if, if I can get the lights out, just to create, just to get some, some mood going here. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. So, so if you're looking back towards the center of the solar system, there will be Planets that are orbiting nearer to the sun than is Saturn. And so we zoom into the bottom, and there is a small dot in the bottom right. That small dot is Earth. All five pixels of it. <laughs> And I will end by reading the pale blue dot from the book of Carl. <laughs> if you look at Earth from space, you see a dot that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of every human being who ever lived, the aggregate of all our joys and sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king, every peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, Every mother and father, every inventor, every explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a moat of dust. Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, so that in glory and in triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of the dot, and scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner of the dot. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another. fervent their hatreds, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, 
There is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. It's up to us. It's been said that astronomy is a humbling and, I might add, character-building experience. To my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration for the folly of human conceit than this distant image of our tiny world. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. Thank you all for your attention.